I was lucky enough to see the 2023 production of Parade with Ben Platt and Michaela Diamond a couple of weeks ago. The show has now closed. It closed on August 6th. But because I didn't manage to get my review out at the time, I'm doing a late review here just to talk about my thoughts on the show and dig into some of the things that really moved me in it and some other things that I was a little confused by and I want to share my experience just to air out that laundry. So I'm from the UK, right? And I've seen a whole load of things in the West End. I've also seen some L LA theater, which has been an interesting experience, a little spotty, some very good, some very bad. And I've also now seen three things on Broadway. I've seen Parade. That was the first thing I ever saw on Broadway. I then saw Funny Girl and I saw Little Shop of Horrors. Now I have videos on my channel for Funny Girl and Little Shop if you want to watch those. But Parade being my first ever Broadway experience was almost overwhelming in a sense. It was really magical to have kind of had Broadway as this vision in my head for a long time and to finally be living that and experiencing it was really, really cool. So straight away, just off the jump, I was ready to love this show. And obviously with the cast that it has in it and the amount of talent in the show, it was set up for success for me. Now, I don't need to opine about how amazing Ben Platt is here or how amazing Michaela Diamond is here. I thought that they were both absolutely wonderful. I think that Ben Platt is so annoyingly effortless in his singing and his performance. It's fantastic. And I'll talk about that a little later. But for now, I'm just going to kind of take you blow by blow through my experience of the show. So number one, I'm sitting in the mezzanine on the left-hand side in a pretty damn good seat. I paid about $185. It's not super far to the side. I was probably about 10 seats from the edge. And my view is stellar. And the show begins and it starts off with this song called The Old Red Hills of Home, which is sort of setting the scene. And I actually got really worried at first because we had an insert that day for who was on. I guess there must have been someone, maybe a swing was on. I'm not sure. But I noticed this when we sat down in the playbells and didn't think anything of it. And then the first person to come on stage is a guy that was not Ben Platt. And I was sort of sitting there going, hold on a minute. Is Ben Platt ill today? Like, do we have a cover on instead of him? And I was so upset for a moment, not realizing that actually it's just a different character that starts the show. Ben doesn't come on until like a little later. So my, my first thought was, no! And then I realized and I went, oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> so this, this old Red Hills of Home song is playing and I've got to be honest, it was the Bernard B. Jacobs Theater and the sound was really not good. And I feel like I talk about this a lot on this channel and I'm a real stickler for it. And I... I have to say, maybe other people just don't care so much. But all the other folks that I was with, we were a party of six, so there were a lot of us. They all said the same thing here, which is that during that first song, you just couldn't understand what they were saying. Like, I'm going to read you a couple of lyrics here, and I'm going to tell you which words were clear. So, for example, they said, Till they've paid for what they've wrought, taken back the lies they've taught, and there's peace in Marietta, and we're safe again in Georgia. Out of all of that, I could pretty much just make out the word Georgia. And then it would be in the land where honor lives and breathes. And I was sort of making out honor breathing or something. The old red hills of home. Okay, I can get that line as well. But so much of the rest of it was unintelligible for all of us. And I don't really understand because we were in pretty good seats. It wouldn't make sense for it to be a complete dead zone of sound in the theater because it was like fairly front and just off center of the mez. And I don't really understand how it's possible that there would be such a big issue in that space. Like, you'd think that it would be pretty balanced and pretty clear, but for whatever reason, there was just, like, noise. It's like the balance of everything was very mushed together for that song. And so we ended up with a situation where you'd kind of catch a word here and there, but then the rest of it would sort of descend into, well, there's a lot of people singing right now, and there's a lot of instrumentation going on, and it's just like, it's almost too overstimulating to take in a singular like line and maybe that's the intent right who knows but i couldn't understand what was going on and that impacted me at the beginning and i was really worried that was going to continue through the entire show now luckily there aren't a huge number of numbers which are those kind of big rousing everyone is on stage and everyone is singing kind of moments and i think that was the saving grace of some of those other songs like i would have been devastated if this is not over yet obviously the kind of best known song from the show was muddy in that same way thankfully it wasn't i think the fact that it's just Ben Platt and Michaela Diamond just singing together and combining their voices in such a wonderful way. That really helped it. But th th this isn't the only issue I had with the, the old Red Hills of Home section because I also felt like it was just a little weird. And again, I couldn't understand what they were saying. So bear in mind that my take here 
is kind of based on incomplete information based on what I was able to pick up. But it felt a little disjointed almost from the rest of the show because they're telling this story of Lucille and Leo Frank and their plight in this seemingly wrongful accusation of Leo, which he then ends up eventually being put in jail for and finally being basically killed by the mob. And so it's it's quite a narrow story in that sense. Like there's a lot of time spent in jail or in a room. And so this Old Red Hills of Home song is, is an unusual one, I think, for me because it's very broad and expansive and wide in its in its scale and its its view. Like it's literally a Confederate soldier singing, let all the blood of the North spill upon them till they've paid for what they wrought, taken back the lies they've taught, etc. So like, I get that thematically you want to set the scene, but when the rest of the scene doesn't necessarily feel like it's got a lot of that energy to it, I, I question whether there might have been a different way that that could happen. Like it felt almost like you had the world of the town or whatever, and then you had the story of Leo that was this little slice, and m maybe if Leo Frank or Lucille Frank had carried that message of the opening of the show there and given you context to the world, maybe that would have felt a little bit more cohesive. It didn't make a big difference on the day though when I was watching it. I still got really into it. I still was really following along and really enjoying everyone's performances. And like I said, Ben Platt, just stellar, so good and so satisfying to listen to as well. Really, really enjoyed his portrayal of the character. But I also want to call out here, what was his name? Alex Joseph Grayson. I thought that he was so good. And the cool thing about what Alex did is you had Ben Platt, who was seemingly, obviously this is not the case, but seemingly putting no effort into his performance. Like this incredible musicality was just coming out of him, almost leaking out of him. And Alex Joseph Grayson in the show did an incredible job of almost being the polar opposite there and overemphasizing all of the effort that he was putting in and all of the the extremity of his performance and of his his character by association and so he'd be belting on stage and you can see the sweat dripping off his forehead you can see that the the contortion that he's putting himself through to get that performance out and i thought that as a choice i'm sure that alex could have sung that very differently and been more like reserved but I think as a choice that he made to be that contrast to some of the other stuff going on on stage was really satisfying and meant that you had these real moments of energy from Leo Frank, but who is a reserved character, and then completely different big energetic moments, but it didn't drain you. It didn't make you feel overwhelmed by big number after big number because those different energies were so distinct from one another. And I think that that was essential to really being able to enjoy Alex's character. And so I wanted to give him props for that. I thought he did a really, really good job. And so things are really moving and you're really feeling like you're on the train and the the mystery of it all is very satisfying because much of this is a mystery in a way. Obviously, you sympathize with Leo's position pretty much the entire time, but still you're seeking facts and you're seeking more info the whole time. And that really pulls you along through that first act and the first act ends really strongly and powerfully. But then act two began and I'm not gonna lie, I felt like it, it kind of lost some of its momentum towards the beginning of it. Like it starts off with one song and then it goes into another song and you're like, oh, the, the energy here is a little low and it's not low in a good way. And so you've got rumbling and rolling, which on the Broadway soundtrack is really, really great, but just in the theater on the day didn't hit the way that I was hoping it might. Then you've got Do It Alone, which is Lucille Frank. You've got Pretty Music from The Governor. You've got Letter to The Governor from The Nurse and Judge Roan. And so all of this is kind of lower on the energy scale or lower on the intensity scale, maybe. And as a result, felt a little less low on the knowing where we're going and on the direction scale, if that makes sense. And then it goes into This Is Not Over Yet. And you're like, oh my God, we're guns blazing. We're going. This is incredible. The momentum is shooting through the roof right now. It's Phenomenal. What a goddamn song. It's so good. But then you kind of have another momentum kind of swing and you feel it kind of lull again. And this basically happened a few times through the second act. Like everyone's putting in great performances, don't get me wrong. I just think that in the way that the show is written and constructed, act one feels like constant ascension towards a climax at the end of the act. Whereas act two feels a bit up and down, a little bit like a roller coaster. And then you get to the end of the act and you would hope that like the end of the show would be a real moment of uh, the pinnacle of the mountain. But 
I, I, I found it a little unusual because, like, I have Jewish heritage and I, in theory, expected myself to really be very, very emotionally invested in the show by the end of the production. And I wasn't as moved as I thought I was going to be. And, and that's not to say that I didn't care, but more so that I think because the end of the show where Leo Frank is killed is pretty abrupt. Like, there isn't a lot of time dwelling in that moment in the show. It basically builds up in a matter of what felt to me, at least at the time, like 90 seconds. And you suspect that it's coming, right? But certainly in terms of the momentum, right, of the second act, because it's not just an increasing upward kind of trajectory, it means that it's in a lull and then it's got to ratchet up for that final moment. And that kind of meant that I was like, oh, oh my God, this is happening. And then it happened and I was like, Oh, uh, okay. And I, 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 I think that there's room for that to be a really good choice. Like maybe they didn't want to really just try and pull you to absolute pieces there and maybe like overdo it in a sense with the way that they cover the death and the way that they really make you feel the emotions of everyone involved. But I think in another show, like obviously this is a very different production. So please don't come for my neck here saying... How dare you even relate the two things? But just to give you a kind of sense of what I'm talking about, brace yourself here for me, please. In Hamilton, <laughs> I can hear the comment section now. Boo! How dare you? I'm sorry. But in Hamilton, just in terms of tracking momentum and emotional arc, you're building up towards the end of the second act. You've got, what's the song called? It's Quiet Uptown, right? Which is already getting you in your feels, right? You're primed in It's Quiet Uptown for, for, for being really sorrowful for the loss of his child and for just the, the loss of everything, right? The destruction of his life. And then you have, again, a death, right? A very key death at the end. And this is why I'm I'm making an analog here and, and, and comparing the two. But then you have that final song, Who Lives, Who Dies, Who Tells Your Story. And in that song, every single time I listen to it, without fail, I'm like, God damn, this is so sad. And it's so sad, not just because in isolation, the song is sad, but it's sad because... The build-up has brought me to the edge of my seat, like the tear is primed, and then I hear that song and it breaks. And I felt like I was missing that a little in Parade. And again, the point of Hamilton is so different to the point of Parade. And I'm absolutely not criticizing Parade for telling a story in the way that it does. I'm just saying that for me, I think that there was room for that to happen. They chose not to, and that's okay, but it's a choice that I can perceive as being separate to another choice that I think could have also equally happened. I want to be very clear about that. I, I promise I'm not saying like, parade's not enough of a tear jerk. No, okay? I just felt like the abruptness of the ending for me left a teeny tiny bit to be desired there. But still, the show is phenomenal. I'm so glad that there is a Broadway cast recording of this. It's the sort of thing that I could imagine there not being, and I don't really know how it works on Broadway so much, but certainly in the UK, there have been certain productions over the last, I don't know, couple of years, or even just the last year, like Tammy Faye at the Almeida Theatre was so incredible. Music by Elton John, Katie Braben playing Tammy, Andrew Rannells playing Jim Backer, Zubin Vala was in it as well, gave a fantastic performance. Uh, incredible show, no cast recording, and I'm devastated to this day. I need that cast recording in my life. And I could just imagine Parade having received that same similar treatment. But no, thankfully we have the soundtrack and it's glorious. And obviously that means that I can listen at home in crystal clear quality. And some of those moments of the show that I missed vocals of because the sound mixing was a little muddy at times are erased and I'm just in heaven. It's blissful. It's lovely. So overall, if I had to give it a rating, I would have loved for this to be a five. But I think based on what I've said, it's a four for me. And that's not to say that I didn't love the show. I adored this experience. I'm so glad that I paid the money. I'm so glad that I managed to catch it while it was on. A blessing, an honor, a privilege. And I hope to be back and seeing more shows on Broadway very soon. But for the meantime, like I said, I saw Funny Girl and Little Shop, and I also have videos on those if you want to check those out.